So we've been talking about service, and uh, uh, we began by talking about the example of all service, and, and our example for all things, Jesus Christ. And then last week we talked about family, and I mentioned at the beginning of that message that all of us have a family, but none of us are neutral about family. Uh, we've all had great or good or bad experiences as it relates to family. And really today's message is similar in that we're talking about the church. And you, maybe you've had no experience with church. Maybe you grew up in church. Maybe that was a good thing or a bad thing, um, depending upon uh, your, your own experience. You know, maybe the church was just a place where people were hypocrites. You know what? Oftentimes people are hypocritical in church. I don't think any more or less than anywhere else in life, but people are hypocrites everywhere. That's just my opinion. I mean, but I, the church is no different. I've told this story before, but I was on the East Coast working, uh, starting a church, helping a guy start a church, and the largest church in the state, now we were in Delaware, so it's a small state, but the largest church in the state had a business meeting where the state police had to be called. And the, the son of the pastor at that time ended up on the back of one of the deacons. And they were in a fist fight and the police were called and they broke it up. What a great testimony for Jesus, amen? I mean, that's horrible. It's horrible. And so this morning we're going to talk about church. And that, that can bring up different ideas and images in your mind. Maybe it's of a building or maybe it's of an experience that you've had. But I, I want to just kind of, again, ask you to sort of set aside some of those things and let's look at God's word about what church should be, what church really should be for us. And the first thing that I want you to understand is that the church is us. The church is believers and followers in Jesus Christ. The church is the people. It's not a building. You can have church anywhere. I've had church outside, inside, in a gym. Um, we had church one time on a bus. Um, I've done that. I've had church uh, in, in uh, open air. Uh, we were in Peru one time on a mission trip, and we were uh, gathered with a, a Peruvian church there, a congregation. And we had church in this uh, covered, it was in the second floor, and it was covered, but all the walls were open, and it was right outside of a place where three highways came together by a river and there was a single lane bridge. So very calm, peaceful setting. Uh, as people took turns, I mean, there was no light, there was no so nobody directing traffic, and when someone went and it wasn't their turn or other people thought it wasn't their turn, they let them know that they were displeased with that situation, you know? And uh, it was a unique setting for church, but we can have church anywhere. But the church is the people. And if you're part of the church, if you know Christ as your Savior, then you might think, well, I'm not sure what part I play. I'm not sure if how I make a difference. How do I affect the church? Even in a church like Belmar, which is relatively small, but still, there can be a lot of people involved, and you might think, well, I don't make much of a difference. But the thing that I want you to know today is that all of us have an important part to play. And I don't, we're going to start off negative this morning. We can, in a negative way, affect the church. Just one person. You know, in Joshua chapter 7, the nation of Israel, the Jews, have... Uh, they've gone into Egypt uh, because of the famine with Joseph. You guys maybe know that story. And then they became enslaved in Egypt. And so God delivered them out of Egypt uh, through uh, these series of, of plagues and, and judgments that God brought on Egypt. And Moses, this great leader, led them out. 
It was such a good story that Disney made a movie about it, right? And, uh, and they came out of Egypt. And then they got to the edge of the promised land. And, and 12 spies went in and they spied out the land. And when they came back, 10 of them said, look, it's great. It's all God said it was, but we can't take it. And because the people listened to this evil report, for 40 years they wandered in the wilderness. Until literally a whole generation died off. The only two old guys left were Joshua and Caleb, who were the two spies who gave a good report. Moses had died, his brother Aaron, who was the first priest, died. And so it's a whole new generation. And God begins to raise up this leader, Joshua, and, and shape him as, as another great leader of Israel. They cross the Jordan in a miraculous crossing where God uh, dries up the river. And they go to this first city of Jericho, this great walled city. And, and the people knew they were coming and they had shut up the walls. And they marched around for seven days and blew trumpets. And the walls came down and they had a tremendous victory. And God had told them, you're going to completely take this city. But everything in this city belongs to me. This is the first city you're of many you're going to conquer. And this first city belongs to me. All of the uh, money and clothing and things that you find need to be dedicated to me. The people were all killed. And this was this victory that God had given. Over 600,000 fighting men, men of fighting age, were a part of the nation of Israel at that time. It was a huge force. Not to mention uh, the women, the children, their livestock. I mean, this was millions of people probably moving together. And it was a, it was a formidable thing. The next sort of stop that they had was a small village named Ai. It was not walled like Jericho was. It was not large. A couple guys went up there, took a little survey, and they said, you know, to move all of these people up there to fight is going to be, that's a huge undertaking. Let's stay where we're at. We can send 3,000 guys up there and take this village with no problem. And so they did that. They sent 3,000 men up there. And it says, that, but the Bible tells us that the people of Ai chased them out. 36 men were killed that day. 36 guys lost their life. Joshua, having been promised great victories by God and, and being just dumbfounded at what had happened, uh, goes into a state of mourning and, and so do all the people. And they begin to pray. And God says, listen, the problem is there's sin. There's disobedience. And so they, they bring all the different tribes out and God shows which tribe is, is, is the problem and then which clan of the tribe and then which family. And eventually they get down to one guy and his name is Achan. And, and, and so Joshua looks at him and he said, you know, what's the deal? And Achan in Joshua chapter 7, he begins to confess his sins. And he said, you know, I saw this silver and I took it. And I saw this hunk of gold and I took it. And I saw this, this garment that was beautiful and, and expensive. And I took that and I buried him in my tent. And if you'll go and look under my tent, you'll find these items. And they... God judged that and, and they ended up putting Achan to death. They killed him. They took these items and they, and they burned him. They consecrated him to the Lord. And then God gave a great victory over Ai. And what's interesting is, as you read through Joshua, after that there's just victory after victory after victory. But you can imagine the different sort of mentality that was there about the people because they realized that sin had had tremendous consequences within the church or not within the church there but within the nation of Israel within that group of people 36 men died because another guy decided he was going to disobey God and so we can have a tremendous effect both for good and bad 
as it relates to the church. Now you say, well, that's the Old Testament. That's the nation of Israel. No, but something similar happens in the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And he said, listen, you've got a sinful situation that's going on there. There was a man who was having a relationship with his stepmother, a sexual relationship. It was, it was horrible. Matter of fact, Paul said, even those outside of the church wouldn't even think of such a thing. But this is going on in the church, and the church wasn't, they weren't really bothered by it. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5, Paul said, listen, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory is not good, Paul said. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? What? Well, leaven is like yeast, right? And you put just a little bit of yeast in a lump of dough, and it will cause the whole lump of dough to rise. Now, I just told you everything I know about baking. Actually, I'm phenomenal. I, I baked cookies last night. Um, you break them apart and set them on the tray, put them in the oven, and boom. Boom. Homemade cookies. Usually my daughter does that for me, but she was downstairs and I said, you know, I can handle this. I almost burned them, but I did. I handled it. Actually, my mom loves to bake and, and she had three sons and she thought that all of her sons should know how to bake. And so she um, forced us to bake cookies when we were little. It was really pretty good because we got to eat cookie dough and then cookies so you know it wasn't too bad I can make cookies from scratch I don't but I can and once a year my mom would make and still does cinnamon rolls homemade from scratch cinnamon rolls now if you're here this morning and you didn't get breakfast there are donuts out there and but this is going to bother you okay these cinnamon rolls are phenomenal we have them every Christmas morning and the dough has to rise a couple of times. And so I remember seeing my mom sprinkle a little bit of yeast into the dough and then leave it alone and then it would rise. And then she would take those cinnamon rolls and she would cut them and roll them and put them in the pan and they weren't very big, but then she would leave them alone and they would rise. And what Paul is saying here is, just like a little bit of yeast affects a whole lot of dough, so too does sin. Because once you put that yeast in the dough and you mix it up, you can't like remove it. You can't just say, well, let me find that yeast and pull it out. It's, it's a part of it. And if we're not careful, sin is the same way. He goes on and says, therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. Don't you want to be a new lump? That'd be a great t-shirt. Anyway, since you truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ our Passover has sacrificed for us. What Paul said is, listen, when there's sin, you've got to get rid of it. Matter of fact, he said in this situation, they took the guy and they said, listen, we're going to remove him from the church. Now, that's not done so that we can feel better. That's not done so that, you know, church discipline is always for the idea of restoration. And Paul addresses that in 2 Corinthians, and we'll look at that here in a moment in Galatians. But understand that we don't want to remove somebody, or even sometimes we have to remove somebody out of our life. That shouldn't be done to just make ourselves feel better. You know, well this person isn't a good influence and, and I'm a lot better than they are and so I just can't hang around them anymore. That's not the attitude we're to have. That's pride and we've got a little leaven in our own lump. You with me? But there are times when situations arise where we say, you know what, I can't be a part of what's going on in this situation or, or with somebody. And that happens even within the church. 
But the goal should always be restoration. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, or uh, verse 5 rather, it says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Listen, it's absolutely true that sin can have a devastating effect, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of those around us. Sin affects those around us. I mean, sin has an effect within our families. It can have an effect within uh, our place of business. And certainly it can have an effect within the church. But the goal should always be restoration. We should always seek when we're dealing with, with the sin of others to remember that we are not without sin ourselves. See, sometimes maybe your sin isn't my sin. Your weakness might not be my weakness. And so it might be easy for me to judge your situation. It might be easy for me to say, well, that's ridiculous, that's foolish, I would never do something like that. And maybe I wouldn't, but I've got my own problems. I've got my own things that'll destroy my life if I'm not careful. And so when we deal with other people, we need to deal with them with the goal of restoration. Understanding that we are not without blame. We are not without fault. And so the Bible describes to us the church as the body of Christ. And I begin to think about this and I thought, you know, have you ever had an infection? I, um, my hands get dry in the winter time. And uh, my wife tells me all the time, you need to use lotion. And I'm like, eh. I, I try sometimes, but it's just not, I'm not a lotion guy, you know? And uh, I know I'm a preacher, so I'm supposed to have soft hands, but uh, I'm not a lotion guy. And so then what will happen is I'll be doing something with my hands, and invariably I'll cut them or nick them, and, and I'll have a problem. A couple of weeks ago I was doing something, I cut myself right there on my thumb, right in the, in the crease. That's a great place, that heals easy. It's almost healed, so I'll probably hit it here in a, another couple of days. That's usually the way it works. But you ever have a little cut like that and then it gets infected? Maybe it turns red, swells up. You can't think about anything else, right? I mean, that's, it, it hurts all the time. And, and everything you go to do, and, and it might be, it could be on your pinky finger, it could be on your pinky toe. But if it hurts, it affects the whole body. It doesn't take much to affect our whole body. But the Bible says that together we are the body of Christ. Now that's symbolic because of the relationship we have with Christ. But he also says we're like a body. And it's easy to say, well, I'm not an important part. But you know, as I was thinking about that this week, I thought, there are parts of my body that I like more than others. Like if you gave me a choice of losing an eye or a pinky toe, I'd probably go with the pinky toe. But then I got to thinking, I don't really want to lose anything. Because I've had my pinky toe hurt before and it hurts. It affects you. And even parts of your body you don't think of when they start to hurt, you can't think about anything else. And it's not which part we are, it's that we're a part. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul's writing to the church at Corinth there and he says, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit, verse four. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit 
of all. And verse 11 says, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Listen, we all have a part to play. Remember, and I'm not a biology expert, but remember when you're in school and you learn the systems of the body, right? There's the skeletal system. That's your bones. And there's the circulatory system, right? And that, that's your blood. Is that right? Okay, so, so should have looked that up, should have Googled that. And you have like a nervous system and you have all these different systems. But if you've ever had a really deep cut or you've ever seen a cadaver or been in some, or, or even dissected a frog when you were a kid, right? Those systems aren't so individualized in your body. You with me? I mean, they're just all kind of crammed in there. You can't just pull out the circulatory system. It's running through the muscular system. They're all interconnected. One of your muscles aches, it affects everything. One of your nerves isn't working right. You get a nerve pinched, it affects everything. That's the example that Paul gives to us. He says, we're the body of Christ. And the Holy Spirit works in all of us. The Holy Spirit is alive and working. And just because you don't have the gifts that somebody else has, or you don't have maybe a position that somebody else has, doesn't mean you're not important. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want to do marvelous things with you and through you. We're all a part of the body regardless of our background. If we keep reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I love these verses. Listen to what Paul says. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Notice what he says there. Listen, the Jews, the Jews looked at themselves as being pretty awesome. I mean, God described them as a group, as God's chosen people. Now, if you're going to be a part of a group, that's a pretty good one to be a part of, right? Who are you? We're just God's special people. Oh, you're not a Jew? Well, then you're not special. You're not chosen. I mean, you're okay, but you're not, you're not one of us. Thank goodness we don't act that way now, right? But he said, listen, whether you're Jew or Greek, whether you're slave or free, now that's a distinction, isn't it? In the Roman Empire at that time, there were millions of slaves. People who were literally the property of other people. And yet Paul said it doesn't matter. Paul was a Roman citizen. That was, to have citizenship in the Roman Empire was a, a step up. I mean, there were just people there were slaves, and then there were Roman citizens. That's who Paul was. Of course, Paul also spent a lot of time in prison, and he said, you know what? It doesn't matter whether you're slave or you're free. For our vernacular, you know what? It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your ethnic background is. It doesn't matter what your spiritual background is. It doesn't matter educationally, economically. The Holy Spirit desires to work in you as a part of the body of Jesus Christ. Folks, that's good news. That's good news. And, and we need to recognize the church should be the place more than any other where we come together as a diverse group, but unified under the cause of Christ. You say, well, I didn't grow up in a good family, or I didn't grow up going to church, or I never finished high school, or, or this is my background, this, that, or the other. It doesn't matter. God loves you so much, he sent his son to die for you. 
You might say, well, you know, I, I grew up in the church and I went to church all my life and, and I, I've got a graduate degree and, and, and I've, I've made a b bunch of money and donated it to the church. That doesn't matter either. God loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you because you needed his son too. And it doesn't matter what we might view as being good or bad or better or worse. We're the same, united under Jesus Christ. And the same Holy Spirit is available to all of us. And God has given you a part to play. He goes on in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 12 and says, But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. Down in verse 24 he says, But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. He says, as one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Notice what he says there in verse 25. He says that God has given us different parts and there should be no schism, no disease, no division. And we are, we are, we are gifted to care for who? One another. One another. I mean, think about your physical body. Nearly every day, I get in the shower. And here's the thing. My nose can't wash itself. I don't take my nose and just, you know, rub it on the bar of soap. My hands work great for that. They can take the wash rag or the loofah. I don't use that, but I'm just saying, if you do, that's fine. We'll, we'll have a counseling. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But it takes all of my body parts to wash all my body parts, right? I mean, I, it really, my hands are the big part of that. But to care for the body. The flip side is, my hands can't go anywhere on their own. Now, when I was younger, I could do a handstand and walk on my hands for about three steps. It was pretty ugly. Now, I don't even want to attempt it. Something would break. I would break something both outside of and a part of my body. You ever, you get older, you ever think you can do something that you used to be able to do? I was telling somebody, I was playing basketball a couple weeks ago, and, and um, it's, it's ugly, but I used, I'm pretty sure I used to be able to play basketball. I, I think, I, I'm pretty sure there, I could, but this guy drove the lane and he went to, to, to shoot and I thought, I'm going to block this guy's shot. And I, and I jumped with the same power that I always thought I used to jump with and, and I reached and extended and, and I missed the ball. I missed the backboard. I mean, I kind of landed and people, you know, were worried I broke a hip. I mean, it was, it was ugly. And I thought, I'm pretty sure I used to be able to do that, but my body doesn't do it anymore. But my hands can't go anywhere on their own. They need my feet and legs. We need each other. We're to minister to one another. God has made us as a body, but there's a quality in the body. We're all in need of Jesus Christ. We're all empowered by the Holy Spirit. And outside of him, we can really do nothing of any value. And so practically, what does that look like? And I want to give you just a couple of passages of scripture this morning as we close. Really just two. The first is found in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is, Acts is really the story of the first church. And in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus Christ gives his great commission to his followers. He ascends back into heaven. They're there and, and there's, there's the 12 disciples and then they've got like 120 
uh, followers that are there, they're praying and the Holy Spirit comes. And Peter begins to preach and, and thousands are added to the church and it's growing and it's just, it's out of control. But for in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, it describes it. It says, and they, talking about the followers of Jesus, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, he said, and had all things in common. And sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now the Bible says it was, it was almost a communal type of situation. That... If someone had a need and someone else had the resources to help meet that need, then they would give that. Say, where are you going with this preacher? Well, we're going to build a wall around the church property. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying something weird, but I am saying that there was no need among them. There was nobody hungry. There was nobody who didn't have something, some clothes to wear. Because if someone else had resources and someone had a need, they recognized that God had given to them so that they could bless somebody else. That's what the church should look like. That's the way the body is. See, the foot doesn't say, hey man, I need all of my blood and I can't share it with anybody else. No, the foot recognizes that the blood is best when it circulates for everybody. The lung doesn't say, hey, look at me, I got all the air. Woohoo. I mean, I sucked it in, so it must all be for me. No, it's got to be shared with the whole body, right? And the body doesn't see any jealousy within itself. Why? Because it's so interconnected. That's the picture of the church. That's what we're supposed to be. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7 says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows in his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Now he talks about this idea of sowing and reaping. This is a biblical, universal principle. Some people say, well, what goes around comes around. Some people call it karma. I don't believe in karma, but I do believe in sowing and reaping. I believe that what you do has an effect and comes back to you. That's what Jesus said. And he said, you can see it in the natural world as well as in the spiritual world. Listen, if you're a person who is loving and gracious and forgiving, people will tend to treat you that way. That's sowing and reaping. If you go out and you, you prepare soil and you make sure that it has the right nutrients and you bury good seed and you water it and make sure it gets plenty of sunlight and keep the weeds from it and in my, at my house the rabbits and the squirrels away too, then you'll reap the results of the planting of that seed. You can see it in the natural world as well. And so we have this idea of sowing and reaping. And he says, don't grow weary in doing what is right. I was talking to someone this week and I said, you know, that's one of the most difficult things because oftentimes sowing and reaping takes a little bit. You know, you can get, you get all excited in springtime, maybe not this weekend, but next weekend, right? It's gonna be, you can get all excited about spring. You can go out and maybe you need to mow your lawn. I really should have mowed my lawn Thursday or Friday. 
That's Colorado, where you whip, whip out the lawnmower one day and the snowblower the next, right? But you mow your lawn and, and, and maybe you're getting that garden ready or your flowers ready and you plant them. And then a week or two later, you want carrots or corn. But it doesn't happen that way, right? I mean, we recognize that you have to plant in spring to reap in the fall. But spiritually and in our lives... You know, you get fired up. Maybe, maybe this is your first time in church in a long time. Or maybe God will just kind of motivate you today. And so tomorrow morning you'll get up and, and you'll read your Bible and you'll pray and, and you'll head off to work and you'll be fired up. And, and you want God's blessing at about 1030. I mean, we're all that way. I, that's the way I am. And then if disappointments come or obstacles come in my way, I'm like, well, what's going on? Well, I might be reaping what I did on Friday or three weeks ago. But he says, don't grow weary in doing what's right because eventually you will reap it. And then I want us to look at verse number 10. He says, all of this about doing what's right and sowing and reaping. And then he says, therefore... And in the Bible, that word therefore really refers back to all that's been said before. it. This is in, in the letter in Galatians. All of these verses, verses 7 through 10, are one paragraph. And so he says all of this about sowing and reaping. And then he says in verse 10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Especially to those who are of the household of faith especially to those people in the church. He says, listen, if you've, if you've sown good things in your life, if you've worked hard and God has given you a harvest, if you have reaped the benefits and the good things and God has blessed you, because of that, seek to do good to all people. You know, I mentioned that God told the Jews that they were God's chosen people. But you know why God brought out Abraham and made him a special people? You know what he said? He said, I want to bless you to bless others. That's why God... That's why God made the covenant with Abraham. He said, I'm going to bless you to be a blessing to other people. And can I tell you, that's why God blesses you. That's why God has given you the things that he's given to you. God blesses us to be a blessing to others. And I believe sometimes God even gives us needs in our life so that other people can be a blessing to us. See, I, I love to just be so blessed by God and have so much that I can share it with others. What a great situation, amen? Who doesn't want to be in that situation? And at different points in my life, God has allowed me to experience that sometimes. But I've also been on the other side where I've had a need and where I didn't see any way that I, that I was going to be able to deal with, with the need that I had. And God used somebody else to be a blessing to me. And really, we need both. We can learn humility through both. God can teach us about his character through both. Man, I was talking to somebody the other day. I will never forget my wife and I were married. We'd gone through a difficult situation. Our, my first job in ministry, I managed to get myself fired. And, and uh, we had a, a, our, our first son, he was a year and a half. And I was going back and doing some schooling and I was working and my wife was working and, and we, were, we were broke. I mean, broke, broke. 
And I remember this couple, that, this family that my wife was working for, they, um, they bought us tickets to the circus. Me and my wife and our son, we went to this circus. Now you have to understand, if it wasn't on free TV, we didn't have entertainment, you know? If our neighbors weren't doing something exciting that we could just watch, we didn't have entertainment, right? I mean, we didn't have an entertainment budget. I mean, anyway, they took us to the circus. I'll never forget that. That was 20 years ago. I'll never forget that. The blessing that that was. Now the circus comes to town. I'm like, eh, got to drive all the way downtown. I don't want to go. But man, what a tremendous blessing that was. Because I couldn't have done it on my own. But God just used that act of kindness. What does God want from you? How has God blessed you? You say, well, preacher, I don't have anything. You know what? Maybe you've got experience and can be a word of encouragement. It doesn't always have to be monetary. Maybe you've got an extra place at a dinner table. Maybe you've got a hug and, and 10 minutes to pray with somebody. Maybe you've got a car to give somebody a ride. Whatever the need is. And I don't know, but I'll tell you what, if you will open yourself up to serving in the church, God will present your resource and a need that is awaiting for you to fill it. You know, we have folks who stand at our doors every week and just welcome people in. I appreciate the job that our greeters do. Right now, we've got people who are watching uh, the, the babies and the preschoolers and the older kids and teaching them so that the adults in here can, can listen and, and participate in the worship service and, and not be worried about their children. And as, as a church, we seek to provide a place where your children are safe and your children are loved and you don't have to worry or be distracted by that. That's a great service. Hey, guys show up this morning and, and guys came early with their shovels and, and, and shoveled the sidewalks. You didn't see that, but you know what? Hopefully you didn't slip coming in. It doesn't have to be a big thing. But God desires, he's equipped each of us to be a part of the body. And my encouragement to you is, if you're not, ask God, how can I be a more effective part of the body? What do I need to do? How can I serve? Because in serving, we will grow in our walk with God. In serving, we will follow the example of our...